Hello class, this is Dr. Palmer here, and uh, we're going to be looking at Chapter 2 of the Constitution. This is Lecture 2.1, and our objectives today are that we're going to learn the ideas behind the American Revolution and how those ideas shaped the Constitution. We're going to identify the causes and the failures of the Articles of Confederation. We're going to describe the delegates to the Constitutional Convention and the core ideas they shared. We're going to identify three types of issues that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention confronted and how the Constitution resolved those issues. We're going to explain the Madisonian system and how it addressed the dilemma of reconciling majority rule with the protection of minority interests. We're also going to contrast the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists in terms of their background and their positions regarding government. We're going to explain the various routes to formal amendment of the Constitution and how the Constitution changes informally. And we're going to explain whether the Constitution establishes a majoritarian democracy and how it limits the scope of government. We might not get to all of these objectives here in one video. We may have to break this up, but uh, let's go ahead and try and see what we can do. Um, a Constitution is a nation's basic law. It creates political institutions, allocates power within government, and often provides guarantees to citizens. Constitutions thus establish who has power in society and how that power is exercised. This chapter examines the background of the Constitution and shows that the main principle regarding uh, or guiding the writing of the Constitution was a concern for limited government and self-determination. The British King and Parliament originally left almost everything except foreign policy and trade to the discretion of the individual colonial governments. However, Britain acquired a vast new territory in North America after the French and Indian War in 1763. Parliament passed a series of taxes to raise revenue for colonial administration and defense of the new territory, and imposed taxes on the colonists without their having direct representation in Parliament. The colonists protested boycotted the taxed goods and threw 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor as a symbolic act of disobedience. Britain reacted by applying economic pressure through a naval blockade of the harbor and the colonists responded by forming the first Continental Congress in September 1774. In May and June of 1776, the Continental Congress began debating resolutions about independence. Um, Richard Henry Lee moved that these United States are and of ought, right ought to be free and independent states. On July 2nd, Lee's motion was formally approved. The Declaration of Independence, written primarily by Thomas Jefferson, was adopted two days later. The Declaration was a political polemic announcing and justifying a revolution. Today it is studied more as a statement of philosophy. American political leaders were profoundly influenced by the writings of John Locke, especially the Second Treatise of Civil Government in 1689. The foundation of Locke's philosophy was a belief in natural rights. Before governments arise, people exist in a state of nature, where they are governed only by the laws of nature. Natural law brings natural rights, including life, liberty, and property. According to Locke, the sole purpose of government was to protect natural rights. Government must be built on the consent of the governed, and it should, it should be a limited government. In particular, governments must provide laws so that people know in advance whether or not their acts will be acceptable. Government cannot take any person's property without his or her consent. There are some remarkable parallels between Locke's thoughts and Jefferson's language in the Declaration of Independence. The sanctity of property was one of the few ideas absent from Jefferson's draft of the Constitution. He altered Locke's phrase, life, liberty, and property, to read, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nevertheless, Locke's views on the importance of, the, of property figured prominently at the Constitutional Convention.
The American Revolution itself was essentially a conservative movement that did not drastically alter the colonialists' way of life. Its primary goal was to restore rights that the colonists felt were already theirs as British subjects. They did not feel a need for great social, economic, or political changes. As a result, the revolution did not create class conflicts that would cause cleavages in society. In 1776, the Congress approved a committee to draw up a plan for a permanent union of the states. That plan was the Articles of Confederation, which became the nation's first governing document. The Articles established a government dominated by the states because the new nation's leaders feared that a strong central government would become as tyrannical as British rule. In general, the weak and ineffective national government could take little independent action. The Continental Congress had few powers outside of maintaining an, maintaining an army and a navy, and had no power to tax or even raise revenue to carry out that function. The weakness of the national government prevented it from dealing with the problems that faced the new nation. Significant changes were occurring in the states. Most significantly, a dramatic increase in democracy and liberty, at least for white males. Expanded political participation brought a new middle class to power. With expanded voting privileges, farmers and craft workers became a decisive majority and the old colonial elite saw its power shrink. A post-war depression had left many small farmers unable to pay their debts and, threatened, and they were threatened with mortgage foreclosures. With some state legislatures now under the control of people more sympathetic to debtors, a few states adopted policies to help debtors, favoring them over creditors. In western Massachusetts, a small band of farmers led by Captain Daniel Shays undertook a series of armed attacks on courthouses to prevent judges from foreclosing on farms. Shays' rebellion spurred the birth of the Constitution and reaffirmed the belief of the Philadelphia delegates that the new federal government needed to be a stronger one. The delegates who were sent to Philadelphia were instructed to meet for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. However, amendment of the Articles required unanimous consent of the states, so the delegates ignored their instructions and began writing a new constitution. Although the men held very different beliefs, they agreed on questions of human nature. The causes of the political conflict and the objects of the object and nature of a Republican government. James Madison of Virginia, who is often called the father of the Constitution, was perhaps the most influential member of the convention in translating political philosophy into governmental architecture. Pennsylvania delegate Gouverneur Morris was responsible for the style and wording of the U.S. Constitution. Written in 1787 and ratified in 1788, the Constitution sets forth the ins institutional structure of the United States and the tasks these institutions perform. It replaced the Articles of Confederation. The 55 delegates at the Constitutional Convention were the post-colonial economic elite. They were mostly wealthy planters, successful lawyers, and merchants, and men of independent wealth. Many were creditors whose loans were being wiped out by cheap paper money. Many were college graduates. As a result, it is not surprising that they would seek to strengthen the economic powers of the new national government. As property holders, these leaders could not imagine a government that did not make its principal objective the preservation of individual rights to acquire and hold wealth. A few, like Governor Morris, were even intent on shutting out the property lists altogether. James Madison claimed that factions arise from the unequal distribution of wealth. One faction is the majority, composed of the many who have little or no property. The other is the minority, composed of the few who hold much wealth. The delegates thought that if left unchecked, either majority or minority faction could become tyrannical. 
The founders believed that the secret of good government is balanced government. A limited government would have to contain checks on its own power. As long as no faction could seize the whole of government at once, tyranny could be avoided. In Madison's words, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Although the Constitution is silent on the issue of equality, some of the most important issues on the policy agenda at Philadelphia concern the issue of equality. Three issues occupied more attention than almost any others. Whether or not the states would be equally represented, what to do about slavery, and whether or not to ensure political equality. The delegates resolved the conflict over representation of the states with the Connecticut Compromise, under which a bicameral legislature would have equal representation for the states in the Senate and representation based on population in the House of Representatives. Although the Connecticut Compromise was intended to maximize equality among the states, it actually gives more power to states with small populations since it is, since it is the Senate that ratifies treaties, confirms presidential nominations, and hears trials of impeachment. The delegates were bitterly divided over the issue of slavery. In the end, they agreed that Congress could limit future importation of slaves, but did not forbid slavery itself in the Constitution. In fact, the Constitution states that persons legally held to service or labors who escaped to free states must be returned to their owners. Northern and Southern delegates also divided over the issue of how to count slaves. Under the Three-Fifths Compromise, both representation and taxation were to be based upon the number of free persons plus three-fifths of all other persons. The delegates dodged the issue of political equality. A few delegates favored universal man suffrage, while others wanted to place property qualifications on the right to vote. Ultimately, they left the issue to the states. Economic issues were high on the policy agenda. The writers of the Constitution charged that the economy was in disarray. Virtually all of them thought a strong, strong national government was needed to bring economic stability to the chaotic union of states that existed under the Articles of Confederation. The delegates made sure that the Constitution clearly spelled out the economic powers of the legislature. Consistent with the general allocation of power in the Constitution, Congress was to be the primary economic policymaker. The delegates felt that there were that they were constructing a limited government that could not threaten personal freedoms, and most believed that the various states were already doing an adequate job of protecting individual rights. As a result, the Constitution says little about personal freedoms. It does prohibit suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, prohibits bills of attainer and ex post facto laws, prohibits the imposition of religious qualifications for holding office in the national government, narrowly defines treason, and outlines strict rules of, of evidence for conviction of treason and upholds the right to trial by jury in criminal cases. The absence of specific protections for individual rights led to widespread criticism during the debates over ratification. We're going to end this video here. Uh, in the next video, we're going to look at the Madisonian system and how Madison and his colleagues dealt with majority and minority factions. We're going to look at how the Constitution was ratified and how we change the Constitution with formal and informal amendments. We're also going to look at how we understand the Constitution in terms of democracy and the impact the Constitution has on policymaking.